Hello all and welcome to the Gestalt IT Rundown, your weekly look at the IT news of the week. I'm your host, Rich Straffolino. I'm an editor here at Gestalt IT. Joining me from across uh, a state or two uh, away from here is the one, the only, the cloud man himself, Ken Nalbone. Ken, welcome to the show. Hello, Rich. Thank you. Pleasure to be joining you once again. Excellent, excellent. And I mentioned the cloud aspect because we have a cloud, let's say a cloud adjacent story that I wanted to lead off the show with. I thought this was really interesting. Uh, CNBC reports that Docker CEO Rob Bearden sent a letter to employees advising that the company was in negotiations with two potential investors to raise additional cash for the startup. Docker has raised to date over 700, or, or, excuse me, over $272 million. So they already have quite a bit sunk in there already. And as of 2017, it was valued at over $1 billion. Uh, since then, I think the consensus is that has gone down. It's a surprising omission for a one-time, or it's, it's a surprising fall from grace, I should say, from a one-time IT unicorn, or at least it seems so on its face. Uh, Ken, is this the case of Docker just uh, taking its time to kind of turn this whale around as it needs to change how it does business to, you know, become, I don't even want to say profitable, but become viable again? Or has Kubernetes dominance really deflated this company? I, so Docker led the charge in making containers mainstream and kind of the charge in how cloud native applications are developed, right? But they didn't have a business model beyond the container itself. They, you know, tried to win the orchestration wars, which Kubernetes won, and now they're facing serious doubts because you can do containers in any number of ways and you're not going to orchestrate them a swarm. So I wouldn't say that they're completely deflated, that they're, you know, not viable at all, but they definitely need a business model other than swarm. Things like professional services and enterprise support are kind of the way to go when you're an open source company trying to make money off of an open source product like Docker. Hopefully they can find their way out of it because they're the darling of the technology space. Everybody loves them, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to pay for what Docker has been asking for money for for the past few years. I hope that they're able to do this. I have no doubt that Docker will continue as an open source project, despite whatever the, you know happens to the enterprise arm of Docker. But it would be nice to see them still exist alongside that open source project, you know? Yeah, and to, and to that credit, you know, I hadn't, um, you know, I follow the company, but maybe not a lot of the the more businessy news of this. And in this report, I didn't realize that they've had three CEOs since 2017, and that's to me the, kind of the question because we've seen any number of companies make that big long shift, and turning that battleship does take some time and money. And so, kind of going from where your business model is, I guess, will win the container wars to, all right, now we're we're doing this longer term play with services and support. I, I have no doubt that that's a that's a way to go about uh, as a as a as a startup. I don't know if you ever you know if you're going to get back to that that unicorn status or that or if you're for, you know kind of forever off that pedestal. But the fact that their corporate leadership is turning over fairly quickly for a variety of reasons, not to say that's necessarily uh, people jumping ship, you know, uh, uh, because you know they don't see a long term future there. But the fact is that doesn't sit, speak to the confidence in that corporate vision to turn that battleship around. Uh, in a timely fashion, uh, you know, certainly if if they're successful in raising this money, it probably will be because they're convincing investors that that's the case. Um, so we will see if if these uh, funding rounds go around. But yeah, I mean, when I just for some context, when I first started with Gestalt IT uh, in late 2016, the I mean, basically, that was like one of the first things uh, I, I learned. Uh, Stephen Foskett kind of sat me down and was like, here's a company. They're called Docker. They're going to be important. Uh, and everybody's talking about them. They're, you know, like you said, those darling of the industry. And it was kind of my introduction to uh, containerization in general. And mm -hmm. to see them fall from grace, it, it's it's kind of surprising right now. Yeah, and I hadn't realized that there was the three CEOs in twenty. In, or sorry, yeah, three CEOs in two years. Element of the story, I guess is how yeah. you put it. Um, that that is concerning. You kind of wonder if really the out for Docker is to try to get someone to buy them. But of course, who needs to buy Docker at this point? I'm not sure who that would be. Yeah, everybody's playing nice with uh, Kubernetes right now. It's not like, uh, you know, uh, with VMware, um, you know, kind of rolling that into vSphere and everything like that with mm -hmm. their recent announcement uh, with uh, Project uh, Pacific. Uh, Project Pacific, you know, yep. that could, because obviously Google's not going to buy them. VMware would maybe be my thought, but. Uh, and again, I don't know how that works out with the money that they've raised already, if that makes any sense for any company out there anyway. Right. You know, and it, it, it could be precarious, too, because somebody could buy them out and then basically kill them, stop developing it, and then they'd suffer even more. Uh, yeah, I've exactly. seen that happen, and I won't name any names, but 
there are certain companies in the industry that have a tendency to buy companies out, stop developing the product and just leach the customer base and, until they are dry. Well, speaking of leaching things till they're dry, the Wall Street Journal reports that the U.S. House Judiciary Committee sent a letter to Google on September 13th, uh, so, you know, a little bit uh, a while ago, uh, inquiring about the company's intention to use any personal data gained with the adoption of DNS over HTTPS uh, for commercial purposes. Since DOH passes DNS over an encrypted connection, the letter states that the committee is worried it would give Google an unfair advantage by denying access to users' data for cable and wireless companies, which traditionally have access to DNS data. Uh, in response, Google said they have no plans to centralize or change people's DNS providers to Google by default. Uh, Google DNS is still a thing. Uh, I think we've all tried it out uh, maybe once or twice, especially when it first came out. Uh, any claim that we are trying to become a centralized encrypted DNS provider is inaccurate. Uh, Google is expected to begin testing DOH rollout in Chrome next month. So they are very much slow rolling this. Firefox is, if anything, being, or Mozilla, I guess, being a little bit more aggressive uh, with DNS over HTTPS and has experienced similar pushback in the EU. Is this wireless and cable companies lobbying to protect a business model here, Ken? Or is this a legit concern? I think it's FUD from special interest groups, plain and simple. Uh, the idea that encrypting all traffic on the internet is not positive overall for consumers is, is false, in my opinion. I, I get that it makes it difficult for ISPs and wireless carriers to collect and monetize data from the customers, but so what? I mean, really, we just want dumb pipes, right? And the sooner they accept that, the better off they'll be. And the differentiator will be, how great is the service they offer? There's a fiber company in my area that has been you know, named one of the top 10 ISPs in the nation, and I just use them for internet. I don't use them for anything else. I don't need them to collect data. I don't need to offer them to offer me anything else. Yes, they do phone and TV services as well, but I don't care about that because I just have the fast pipe that I want. Uh, and it's not like this is the first, like you pointed out, Firefox is being aggressive about this. Cloudflare had their own means of, uh, you know, encrypting DNS traffic with their 1.1.1.1. How many ones did I say? Four ones. <laughs> Enough. Service. Yes. Uh, so it's, it's nothing new. And I only see it as a net positive. For Ooh, Ken, you know what? You broke up right now. So I'm not sure uh, if I am on or not. But yeah, uh, to kind of reiterate, I do see this as you know, uh, definitely FUD by the cable and wireless companies. It does make me question, though, how much value they're getting uh, out of this DNS data that they seemingly have been able to collect uh, without issue for a very long time. And I wonder if that will come to light as part of this. Um, you know, Google is no stranger to lobbying themselves. So I feel like if push comes to shove, they have a lot of uh, artillery to kind of throw at this fight if that's what this becomes. I, I, I think this is maybe just uh, making Google, you know, making some some pledges um, to satisfy the cable and wireless companies, but we will see where it goes uh, from there. Uh, we're going to move on now, Ken, and I hope uh, we see you back here in just a moment here. Uh, next up here, we have uh, WeWork, the co-working rental startup WeWork, I think uh, we're all familiar with, announced it's withdrawing its S1 filing as it postpones its initial public offering. Since announcing its intent to go public on August 14th, the company's co-founder, Adam Newman, stepped down as CEO and diluted his voting power with the company on September 24th, going from, I think it was 10 to 1, uh, his, his shares had uh, 10 to 1 voting power, now down to 3 to 1, and he kind of loses that uh, complete control of the company that seemingly he had with that voting power. In a statement, co-CEOs, the new co-CEOs, Artie Minson and Sebastian Gunningham, said the company will focus on its core business and intends to run WeWork like a public company and will revisit going public at a later date. So hopefully bring some more accountability and less um, uh, almost Silicon Valley parody to the company that seemed to have been happening as of late. In its last private valuation, WeWork had been valued at $47 billion, but after its S1, sources are speaking uh, to CNBC said that public investors were valuing it below $15 billion and just kind of shows you uh, how drastic the reaction, uh, I think, is uh, to what we were, uh, everything, all the visibility that had been suddenly shined on WeWork. This has been a year of bad to middling tech IPOs, um, anything from Uber and Lyft uh, within the past uh, 12 months. Uh, to, to any number of companies now, Airbnb, I guess, is going to be doing this. We've seen companies kind of going around a traditional IPO. Uh, I'm thinking in terms of Spotify, you know, going with that direct listing uh, and not necessarily seeking to raise money 
uh, but just to kind of get the shares out there and, and begin that process without necessarily so much scrutiny uh, and, and so much volatility that an IPO could theoretically bring. It makes me wonder why WeWork, knowing what its financials look like, knowing what its corporate structure looked like, uh, it didn't at least consider that a little more seriously. But I have to think this is a big black eye for the company and maybe a little bit of common sense from some of these crazy valuations that we're seeing for companies that have these mounting losses. I'm thinking uh, companies like Uber, companies like Lyft, where yes, traditionally the path of, of any IPO for a tech company is you lead with those big losses at first, then over time, you know, you, you, you turn the corner and then you hit that exponential uh, revenue growth and you're able to pay back and everybody makes bags and bags of cash. I think we're seeing a lot of skepticism. We work especially had losses that were effectively uh, around the same as Uber was seeing, but with a tenth of the revenue. And given the volatility, potential volatility of the real estate market that they're very much tied to, uh, and and the fact that they were you know kind of tied up in these long term leases, and really they weren't going to see any economies of scale. That's the other big thing. Uh, with WeWork is that it doesn't get more efficient to rent more buildings, the more buildings you rent. And I think there was a lot of skepticism around that. I still think we'll see them IPO eventually. I mean, if nothing else, there's so much money already sunk into this company from organizations like SoftBank, which was really trying very hard to get this company to IPO before that. Um, so we will see how that goes. And uh, if we see them going public uh, later on. Ken, Oh, I'm joined in here by Ken. Uh, once again, uh, Ken, thanks for joining us back here. We just finished talking about uh, WeWork. Any thoughts about them canceling their IPO uh, in general? I mean, in general, you know, obviously they're doing it because a lot has come to light about the business practices and the CEO in general. Um, people keep treating this as a tech story, which in my opinion, it's largely not just because they're using a digital platform to deliver what is a very un- you, it's, it's, a, it's a typical business model. I don't see them doing a whole lot of things that are different than other leasing companies have done in the past. They're just leveraging a digital platform to do it now. So, well, and they also have a huge footprint with tech startups themselves. Yeah. Right? It's, like, it's a product that tech startups use. So, that combined with being on a digital platform kind of gets thrown into the tech press, right? Right. And I guess that's the only reason that people view this as a tech story because they are courting tech companies, not because they are largely a tech company themselves. Uh, but yeah. they've been so focused on growth that they've been ignoring profits. And there's questionable business practices about the way that I think the owners, the owners have been leasing back their own properties to the company and, you know, has, has drawn a lot of scrutiny. Hence, we see the delayed IPO as kind of things came to light, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So I, I like I said, I, I still think we're going to see them IPO at some point just because uh, SoftBank ain't putting money into you to not IPO. Uh, but I think they're they're going to take their time and, and try to get their financial house in order before they put out another S1 filing. That's for sure. Right. At the end of the I, day, I, I think that this is not necessarily a failure of VCs because they take risks. And this was a risk and it didn't pay off. But as long as overall their trend is upward, then business as usual, right? Yeah, and 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 if the very least this didn't go to the public investor who you know mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to say is uninformed but perhaps has less leverage certainly than a VC and isn't being sold a bill of goods that they can't deliver at least yet. Right. All right. Next up here, Linus Torvalds approved a new Linux kernel lockdown security feature, which will enable, uh, 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 which when enabled will restrict some kernel functionality from even root users. The features come in two modes. Uh, the first one is called integrity, which disables kernel features that allow user land to modify the running kernel and confidentiality, which disables features that extract confidential, confidential information from the kernel. The feature will ship as a Linux security module as part of Linux kernel 5.4 and will be disabled by default because evidently it breaks a ton of stuff uh, if you just turn it on willy nilly. Uh, isn't this though just making the argument for why we need micro kernels here, Ken? I mean, isn't that the whole point of the, of those? And and is this Linux becoming micro kernel ish? I don't know. I always uh, saw micro kernels as a more single use and high performance uh, type of application, with the benefit of also being more secure than the generic Linux kernel. But I guess yes, they're also you know a security play. Um, but you know, th this is basically going to be another thing for lazy sysadmins to turn off just like SE Linux before it, right? <laughs> uh, the uptake will be interesting, but this sounds like something only 1% or even less of implementations will use. More security is never a bad thing, but so many people are going to ignore and disable this in favor of simplicity. So 
until it has a long history is baked in and people know how to use it, we're not going to see a wide adoption, right? Yeah, I mean, that's, this is where Linux, you know, uh, being long in the tooth, having a, having a fairly long legacy may come become problematic for them because, yeah, anything, any new apps that are written on there theoretically could take this into account and maybe not make it a big deal. But I imagine because they're disabling it by default is, be, like I said, because it breaks a ton of stuff. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how quick we're going to be seeing core uh, Linux functionality kind of being rewritten or not, maybe not core Linux functionality, but uh, you know, the, the, the standard apps that everybody depends on getting rewritten to run effectively to not let root touch the kernel at all is another story entirely. So I guess you're only going to see it implemented in specific use cases, just like a micro kernel. So I guess you're right, Rich. Hey. <laughs> uh, next up here, what I also hope to be right about is, is this the year of VDI, Ken? Uh, everybody take a drink uh, because we just said it. Microsoft made the Windows Virtual Desktop generally available at the end of September uh, after kicking it around in public preview since March and announcing it uh, effectively a year ago. So a pretty fast turnaround from going from announced to general availability. Uh, client apps are now available for Windows, Android, Mac, iOS, and HTML5. So I guess the uh, one guy still running BIOS is out of luck. Honestly. Aside from multi-user Windows 10 virtualization, WVD will virtualize Windows 7 desktops for free with extended security update support through January 2023. That's two more years after Microsoft will officially end support for the OS. So I thought that was a pretty key consideration. Will WVD finally make 2019 the year of VDI, Ken? The year of VDI will always be next year. Uh, <laughs> I mean, there's always going to be workforces that VDI is not fit for. You know, the road warriors who need to be able to access their apps and data regardless of coverage. And yeah, they can get on airplane Wi-Fi and uh, maybe a hotspot when they're in the middle of nowhere so they can sync up their cloud drive so they can get emails or whatever, but they're always going to need a lot of stuff local. So virtual desktops will never work for a certain class of user. But there are plenty of VDI shops out there already. It's probably going to continue to grow. If I'm already in the VDI space and I'm looking at an infrastructure refresh, or if I'm considering VDI, then I'm going to look at services like this one from Microsoft or AWS Workspaces or anybody that's delivering VDI as a service because simplicity is the name of the game when it comes to enterprise IT now, right? And the fact that I can just deploy this service without having to worry about the infrastructure and the installation and care and feeding of everything to keep it up to date why would I choose to do that, right? I mean, maybe it becomes a cost play, but for most people, their time is worth enough that it makes it a, an easier decision. And if you've got the high enough bandwidth internet connection into these clouds for your users to have a good experience, why would you not choose that? What about that uh, extension of Windows 7 support for free for you know basically two years after end of life? Does that move the needle at all in terms of adoption for this service or is this just a nice carrot to kind of get people on board yeah i don't know about that i mean because microsoft did something similar with uh, server 2008 i think if you have server 2008 in azure you get extended support instead of running it mm -hmm. on premises if i need to make the transition to vdi so that i can maintain windows 7 support is it not just easier to also <laughs> change desktop os's i i don't i don't really know maybe there's some cases where it's like oh somehow i can virtualize this very specialized desktop and have it in the cloud now i don't know if that will work if that'll be supported I see very few use cases where that is feasible or really valuable. All right. Uh, speaking of arguable valuableness, uh, that was a horrible transition. A Good try, though. Or, uh, hey, I got I to gotta try. I got to try. Uh, we were talking about dumb pipes earlier. This is the transition I should have made. We were talking about dumb pipes earlier, and that kind of came into play with the new federal appeals court ruling in favor of the US FCC concerning its 2017 repeal of net neutrality rules uh, that have put, been put into a place by the Tom Wheeler led FCC a few years before that. The court found the appeals of consumers, tech companies, and government officials to be unconvincing to warrant reversing the decision. However, the court ruled that the FCC overstepped its bounds in stating that states, uh, U.S. states, couldn't impose their own net neutrality rules uh, like California and Vermont have already done to varying degrees. Uh, the court also ruled that the FCC must remand the repeal to address concerns for first responders uh, who had uh, initially uh, filed with the FCC saying that they were concerned about ISPs overcharging them to get priority service uh, for life-saving, uh, uh, you know, eff effectively life-saving infrastructure. Is, net neutral uh, is, a, is a patchwork of state net neutrality rules better than no net neutrality rules, Ken? I guess, but it's still not good and it's still not going to work. And we really do need a, a larger solution to this problem. And I think mm -hmm. 
this is just another example of consumer interest not being protected because lawmakers who don't understand technology are making policy decisions. There used to be something called the Office of Technology Assessment. It existed, I think, from 1972 until 1995 when lawmakers disassembled it at that part. It was basically meant to be a bipartisan branch of the government to advise lawmakers on policy decisions regarding technology. Not only is that office needed for maybe the legislative branch, but I think for the judicial branch as well, because I feel like they probably made their decisions because they're not completely informed and they're getting their information probably from the lawyers on either side of this case who do their best to explain it, but are also doing it from what's best They're for their client. They certainly have an interest. They uh, have right, an agenda, right? right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, and the, the, this landscape is too complex for lawmakers and enforcers to navigate on their own with that, the advice of somebody who truly does understand it and gets to present it to them in an impartial manner. Yeah, and it's interesting you bring that up. I know uh, that was something uh, uh, Elizabeth Warren on the campaign trail was kind of advocating bringing that back. And that also brings into question, you know, any number of uh, patent disputes, which I know she certainly has uh, uh, the the uh, uh, the law background, you know, to kind of to kind of appreciate that. But that could have that could have impacts on a wide variety of tech issues, not necessarily just net neutrality or something like that, but definitely, you know, to kind of inform uh, our, you know, people that. And to be fair, like I. It, it's easy to uh, to be critical of government officials that don't understand these larger issues, but something like net neutrality, I think, is, is more complex than most people want mm -hmm. to admit. And because it is, you can have then someone like uh, FCC Chairman Ajit Pai come in. It kind of conflates, you know, Google's dominance with ISPs, even though they operate on totally different, you know, uh, kind of tiers of the network, as it were, and they offer totally different services. Because you don't have a, a more nuanced understanding of that, it's easy to conflate those two. Because hey, look, there's big giant scary company over here and big giant scary company over here, and you know, we we obviously need to protect. Uh, you know, it's it's easy to frame protecting consumers in that regard um, when it's easy to conflate those two. So uh, definitely uh, having an office that's responsible for kind of informing lawmakers, I think is a good idea because I, I do think it is unfair to ask elected officials to have nuanced understandings of these larger issues because they are co more complex than I think we give them credit for. And they have so much more to understand, like things like foreign policy and healthcare and all the other issues that matter to uh, the American population that they have advisors for, right? Yeah, exactly. Well, and to be fair, these these all these legislatures have extensive staffs. So sure. Yeah. Yes, they should be uh, uh, not being uninformed. It's no excuse to be uninformed, but having an office that you know theoretically is nonpartisan and uh, you know be dedicated just to that, I think would be very interesting. Also, just to get public information out there as well, not just being uh, you know having staffers informing specific legislatures about what would be advant advantageous, maybe in their district or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry to take you down that rabbit hole. I know we were talking about net neutrality. In I, short, okay. I'm in favor of it. And I think somebody needs to explain it to the people in charge of making laws and enforcing them so they understand it better than they clearly do not yeah. already. Yeah. And if nothing else, though, at least we will have uh, theoretically have stronger state laws and we can see, you know, if, you know, theoretically what kind of national will there is for that on a state by state level. I know there's all sorts of politics involved, uh, even on the, you know, especially on the state level, if nothing else, but uh, it, at least it's not completely denuded. And I think that's been very reasonable restraint, even if the, the court didn't necessarily understand uh, the, the complexities of net neutrality. Yeah. So I guess that's a win. I don't know. Winish, it's it's a tie. <laughs> I guess nobody's happy. Right. And finally, that's probably a, a probably a good. Isn't that what they say? If uh, if two sides come out and neither is happy, that's a good sign. Probably, yeah. All right, and finally here, hey, PDFs, they're not secure. Uh, researchers at Ruhr University and Munster University, which is the tastiest university, published details about an encrypted PDF exploit called PDFX or PDFX, I'm not sure. One variety of the attack takes advantage of the fact that PDF encryption doesn't encrypt all of the content, allowing someone to tamper with the unencrypted parts of the file to send back uh, the file to, uh, to a designated server once decrypted. So essentially you open it up and the unencrypted parts can inform once the file is open and unencrypted to send that unencrypted file back. The second variant modifies the ciphertext, that is the actual encrypted text, to exfiltrate itself after, uh, after decryption, otherwise known as CBC gadgets. This can work because PDFs don't support authentication for encryption. 
The team successfully used PDFX on 27 web and desktop PDF viewers. I think the most secure ones uh, were Safari and uh, actually Preview, uh, both uh, uh, Mac software there, although they were still uh, able to be exploited in some way. Uh, but however, since uh, the findings, the PDF maker viewers have been contacted and have subsequently released patches. But the researchers say the underlying issue could only be truly corrected by a change to the PDF specification. Ken, didn't we always assume PDFs were kind of leaky anyway? So, I, you know, serious, yes, for sure, if you're under the impression that this is encrypted. But I don't, I don't think a ton of people are thinking PDFs are secure by default. Uh, maybe consumers are. I mean, I, I have personal experience where somebody clearly assumed a PDF was secure because it was a financial institution sending me in a, a document with sensitive information over email. And, you know, the PDF was encrypted, password protected. And then they, you know, told me in that same email, hey, the password is the last four of your social or something like that. So, I mean, you always need layers of security with anything anyway, right? I don't, most people who use PDFs probably have no idea how the security works on them anyway. You know, we as technologists are probably like, no, I don't think I want to do that. But plenty of consumers are like, oh, there's a password that must mean it's safe. So <laughs> I'm always in favor of, you know, multiple levels of security anyway, when it comes to, you know, protected information or really just any information. This kind of goes back to the conversation we were having about DNS over HTTPS. Yes. Why would that, why would that be bad for anybody to have an extra layer of security kind of baked in to your browser or your OS? And then all of a sudden it, it you know, adds protection without complexity for the users. And so I, you know, of course, you know, PDFs are going to be vulnerable in some way to something at, at all times. So you might as well do your due diligence and protect yourself in any way you can regardless of the document format of the solution being used. So yeah, yes, and, and, and... it was, it was insecure. So what? Well, and as we've as we've learned, I think, uh, you know, or at least I've learned, you know, watching any number of security field day presentations or just kind of following the industry is that really security now is about it's not about putting up that impenetrable firewall. Right. It's about, you know, uh, allowing yourself to fail gracefully, putting up speed bumps to various different ways. So, yes, if someone gets a hand on an encrypted file, they can engineer it so that if they give that back to you, you can open it up and have them send back the unencrypted file. But it's better than not having the ability to encrypt it at all, certainly, you sure. know, and, and, and that's a relatively specific attack. Good that they're contacting people, good that this is being brought to light so that future PDF specifications can address it and improve encryption overall. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, like you were saying, there there are uh, there's a spectrum of security and maybe this just means, you know, PDFs are a little bit further to the insecure side of that spectrum, but not that we should abandon uh, all hope. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I mean, it, with, with any document format, you're probably going to want to implement some kind of chain of custody verification and security along the way so that, you know, between the sending party and the receiving party, nobody else could have spied on it. it, it maybe some sort of, maybe some sort of distributed ledger. Am I hearing oh, PDF God. blockchain encryption? No, yes. no, I did not we say we need a blockchain. <laughs> blockchain all the things damn you uh, rich well, <laughs> well that just about brings us to whenever i'm damned i know that's the end of the gestalt <laughs> it rundown ken thanks for putting up with some technical difficulties today uh where can people find more of your great stuff uh if they're so inclined i'm writing all the time on gestaltit.com so check out my writing there check me out on twitter as well for my random thoughts about technology or just about anything in general that i like and, uh, you know, be sure to check me out every once in a while on techfieldday.com. We're producing new events all the time. I had Cloud Field Day last week. I'll have more coming uh, in, the, in early 2020. And you can catch our other events from our other coworkers over at techfieldday.com on a regular basis. Excellent. Yeah, make sure you check out gestaltit.com. We also have some new video content. I've been putting out, or I'm going to be trying to be putting out some weekly videos, uh, kind of doing uh, some deeper dives, some hotter takes, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, similar to the stuff we talked about, the Gestalt IT rundown. I just did one on if Slack is doomed last week. So check that out in our YouTube channel. Just search for Gestalt IT on YouTube, and you can find that there or at gestaltit.com as well. You can find me on Twitter at Mr. Anthropology. That's MR Anthropology. Uh, thanks for watching, everybody. We will be back next Wednesday, 12.30 p.m., Eastern time running down the IT news of the week. Until then, remember everybody, have a super sparkly day. <laughs>